Uh, my job today is to introduce our moderator, Dr. Angelina Weenie, called for many years, and she will also start this morning with a, a prayer. Angelina is a Queen's Cree from Sweetgrass First Nation, which is one of the 74 bands in Saskatchewan. And she is a fluent uh, speaker with the Wyda and an associate professor of First Nations University of Canada and Indigenous Education uh, for many years. She serves as the program coordinator and she's committed to reclaiming Indigenous knowledges and Indigenous languages. And her teaching areas include epistemology, educational professional studies, land based education, culturally responsive education, Indigenous pedagogy, curriculum development, and research methods. And if you know anything about First Nations University, you know that uh, the broad title of many, many tasks that people work very hard to meet the needs of students uh, throughout Saskatchewan. So thank you, Angelina, for participating, and I look forward to hearing from you at this which means I, I greet you and I shake hands with each of you. I'm happy to be here today to moderate this panel on um, the importance of culturally relevant um, education and uh, to talk about the uh, First Nations University of Canada and higher learning. So I will begin with uh, a short prayer that is similar. And it's um, important to acknowledge spirituality whenever we do things. And uh, it's to be thankful for this day and to ask for prayers for our families for ourselves. Hanun Dawinan, and as long to Nana Magota Pisigawa Nea, with Zingana Muta, Questi Vega Tispai, we want to name Sigar Pute Heroin, and we sent to him, and we are named the Paxim Wakanich, the Tanin Sigaiki, Aitan. So it is to uh, ask for good relations in all that we do. And so I just want to uh, begin by talking a bit about uh, why First Nations University of Canada is here. I listened to the elders and they talked about their vision. The late Isidore Palche would talk about how they would sit outside. This place was not here yet. They would envision a place for First Nations people would learn about their languages, cultures, languages, traditions. That's why they exist. It was their vision that helped us to be here today. We acknowledge them and give thanks. And it was 2003 that this building was uh, opened. And so, very happy to have uh, four renowned speakers here um, with us. And so uh, I want to begin with uh, Dr. Blair Stonechow, who was uh, you know, former president and, uh, of SIFC at the time, Saskatchewan Indian Federated College, is what it, our university was called for before. So I'd like to invite him to uh, share his thoughts. And he has also written a book, The Lost of Indigenous Eden, and he's written about higher learning. So, thank you all for being here. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here. And uh, folks, it's appropriate to recognize the parade first. Uh, that's uh, considered to be the most important uh, part of the uh, introduction. And I don't know if we also need to go with the uh, tango, which has been uh, coordinated the other day, because uh, he plays such an important role uh, for us. As a matter of fact, uh, Prince Edward opened this building in uh, 2003. And then a few years later, uh, the Queen herself and Prince Philip uh, visited this building. 
And it's interesting because, uh, you know, usually when we uh, go out to do visits, uh, people come over and design the apartments. But uh, on this occasion, it was actually the plane that brought the apartment across. Uh, she brought a piece of stone from Melbourne, Palmer, which uh, it used to be displayed here because it's a historic you know, but uh, you know, the point is uh, recognition of the uh, role of First Nations in helping to uh, support the you know, presence of uh, continuing presence of the British in North America. And uh, just uh, just yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh, my daughter was asking me, you know, what's the big fuss about uh, about the uh, the Queen and, and, and the King and stuff? And sort of saying, well, you know, they didn't they steal our land? <laughs> so I said, basically what I said is, well, you know, before the British came, uh, we had a beautiful house, which we built here. It was made of beautiful ash materials, and everybody came along, people they came along and made sure, and, and we were good to the, you know, good to the environment. And then uh, visitors came along, and, uh, you know, they, you know, Showed an interest in the land, and we moved in, we welcomed it. And uh, so we built a house together. And uh, the foundation of the house is the trees. And I said, it's, uh, you know, because she was saying, why don't you just get rid of the barn? And, uh, I said, well, you know, that's kind of like, you know, taking the house and ripping off the foundation. And then what do you want? What do you want? So, um, yeah, so certainly, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, we had an important relationship, uh, which I think is also uh, an important relationship with, uh, with uh, you know, for all of us in this uh, country. Anyway, uh, I, uh, as uh, Angelina mentioned, I um, am, uh, have written a book, which I actually uh, is going to be given out uh, as I give to uh, our uh, speakers at this, this conference. And, and the uh, and, uh, and, uh, presenters. And uh, this is the book here. It's uh, called The Loss of Indigenous Eden. And uh, in this book, uh, I had mentioned to my president uh, when I heard that this, uh, this uh, session was in the elder, I said, you know, I wrote a chapter in this book. I wrote a chapter critiquing the knowledge at universities. And I said that. Uh, uh, you know, the, it's, it's, a, it's a critique basically of uh, the rational system that's, uh, that's used in the age of reason and rational thinking. And how this was not the way that our elders uh, taught us uh, higher knowledge. And uh, we didn't even have uh, our own concept of higher knowledge. And it was actually one of the reasons why this their university was created. Um, and uh, when this uh, First Nations University was first envisioned, and I guess I can speak with authority because I was actually the first uh, faculty member of Iron Group in 76, um, the, um, the elder said, you know, under the treaties, we should have our own uh, institution of higher education where we can teach our own knowledge. You know, how we gain our knowledge and how you know, uh, knowledge is important to us. And so, um, when I first started here, one of the first uh, elders I met was an elder by the name of uh, Ernest Matusis, who's uh, deceased now. But uh, Ernest used to have uh, a thing he liked to talk about. Just, and I remember he was actually uh, interviewed by Roy Bonestero. Uh, on CBC way back in the, in the 70s. And uh, his line was, you know, we indigenous people used to live in the Garden of Eden, and we have the place to raise the greater. That was his message. And uh, of course, uh, being a, a residential school survivor didn't quite, uh, you know, didn't quite resonate with me. You know, I was thinking back of all of the things I used to hear at residential school about Bible and about the Adam and Eve and uh, the Garden of Eden and stuff, and I thought, you know, I thought this guy has been reading the Bible too much. <laughs> but it turns out that he had a far different message, which it took me years really to figure out you know, what he told me, it just kind of always stuck in my mind. And um, 
So what he really meant was that we had all the way living uh, in, you know, in the world. And uh, that, uh, that philosophy and way of looking at it came from our elders. The original instructions, which didn't come from the Bible or any textbook, but rather it came from sincere, uh, you know, like praying and supernatural guidance and information. And interestingly enough, that was uh, people who were involved in ceremonies and some of them wouldn't get answers. And, uh, you know, these answers uh, have been passed on through generations. And the uh, answer basically is that uh, you know, we as, as humans, uh, we are here, we've been given permission by the Lord to be here, to experience this physical life in order to learn, especially uh, to learn how to go along with uh, you know, all our, our relations with like animals and plants and all the other cool things. Uh, and part of that, is the original instructions were simple. It was be thankful for this uh, gifts of the gifts of creation that we allowed to experience and respect them, take care of them as stewards. Very simple uh, instructions. And so uh, that's what we did. You know, people uh, you know, came here to stores who came here and said that uh, you know, we were uh, unprogressive, we were uncivilized, you know, we weren't making use of things. Exploiting the environment, but you know what? What I tell uh, my students, what I tell them, because you know we did have an economic policy, we had a social policy, and that economic policy was very simple. It was not to destroy the environment, but rather to nurture it, you know, so that future generations would have even more natural resources to build. That's why there were millions of buffalo. That's why we're like you know. Millions of them, they see a passenger bushes. And uh, so many questions you see that kind of in the first uh, explorers uh, explore to here. You know, they put a basket and then wash it from you know, a whole bunch of fish. So this was our economic policy. But it wasn't understood by those who came here. We thought that you know, these are all things that you know, uh, man is entitled to just take and uh, you know, use for our own you know, economic benefit. You know, for gaining power and for you know, building empires and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so, you know, uh, you know, we told not to go into a lecture here because it's kind of So I'll keep it short. Uh, but uh, that's essentially what the book is about. So, you know, uh, loss of the scene. Uh, what I say in the book basically is that. Uh, there was a situation across the world where indigenous peoples are just small over the world, and we all had very similar uh, ideologies and spiritual beliefs, which, had, which connected us very closely with the environment as well as to the supernatural. And I'll, I'll just leave you with a couple of interesting uh, uh, tidbits of information. Uh, one is, and I actually like to kind of ask what you know, you think about the health of this, this is even across from anything. So, how long it has it been since indigenous peoples have been the majority of the world population? Well, I did research on that as part of this book, and it turns out that uh, it was only in the 1820s that non indigenous people became the majority of the world population. That's only 400 years ago. So that's one interesting thing that, uh, that I found. Uh, another interesting thing was, uh, um, you know, uh, our, the question of our own survival. And um, you know, one of the things which I was interested in was, you know, how long should we be as human beings? How long should we be on Earth as a species? We want to call ourselves species, and you know, we're here to look at similar species. And so the answer is, you know, we're going to survive as long as similar species. Uh, then we should be on on the Earth. We should be able to persist on the Earth for a million years. And so we're told by archaeologists and Genesis that uh, there were longer than the species. Uh, Homo sapiens happens have been here for 200,000 years. So we do the same math. We have just a, we have only another 800,000 years to go. So, um, 
you know, that's one of the questions that I, I ask is, you know, what's our, what's our policy? You know, we're so clever, right? What's our policy to survive in the next 100,000 years? And, uh, of course, I always have that moment by saying, well, you know, maybe we should ask the numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stonechild. Very happy that you joined us today and shared your knowledge. And uh, so next we have uh, uh, Kat Stenorm, and he was uh, uh, a graduate of our uh, university, and also he was uh, he's former chief of Kawasis, and he. Uh, He's now in a new role, so I'll let him tell you about his new role. <laughs> Welcome, Candice. Nanaskaman, thank you, Dr. Mimi, and good morning to everybody. And it's such an honor to be here, and so much uh, amazing people and academia leaders uh, here at the First Nations University of Canada. Uh, where we sit right now, this teepee is called the First Nation Veterans Memorial Teepee. And uh, a little bit um, speaking on, uh, just in continuing of Dr. Stonechild, uh, in the relationship that Indigenous people have uh, with Canadians and Canada, this is a really important teepee because it solidifies that bond that at one time Indigenous people because of treaty relationships, the agreement was that the ancestors of my ancestors at the time of treaty one in our sorry at World War One, World War Two, my and my great grandparents didn't have to go and fight the Western world in wars, and vice versa. Uh, back in the 1800s, when the Cree and Sono and the Dakota used to have uh, territorial relationships. But a lot of indigenous people went to war because they wanted that bond and that relationship with the crown to be here as long as the sun shines, grass grows, and river flows. And that's why it's really important to recognize that First Nations University of Canada is an indigenous higher learning institution. But even at the heart of it, and behind me are ceremonial TV, the main classroom in this institution, but where we sit here. Uh, I think I'm gonna act like a five minutes. Eh? Like I'm a politician, so I gotta ask how much time I have. Uh, I just wanted to add two things. I, I look forward to the panel, and I know with some of you and some of you have been really nice to, to meet you in, in this perspective. What is higher learning? And what is the relationship? You know, the first thing that we gotta understand in the reality of 2023 is that we all inherited something today. And what, we, what I mean by that is nobody today created a residential school, nobody today created the Indian app, nobody today created the 60s school. But as Indigenous people and as Canadians, we inherited this moment. And sometimes when we're addressing the wrongs that we inherited, it comes from a place of guilt or a place of shame or a place of I can't believe like this happened. You know, that's that's the important part of the fuel of why we're doing this today is because what is the end goal? Right now we're in 2023. We do have an end goal. And the end goal is that indigenous people want parity. Want parity in Canada while our indigenous worldview isn't tested or oppressed anymore. And to get to that end goal, we're going to disagree on how to get there. That's human nature. We disagree on a lot of things, not just an indigenous thing, but we got to all agree on the end goal. But what is the journey to get there? One of the things that's challenging today is decolonization. I always like to tease as a technology university word that nobody can really define, but um, we all know it's an important word, decolonization. <laughs> But what does that mean to truly get there as we decolonize? Because colonization was tough on indigenous people, 
decolonization is going to be even more tough because of what we've just been through. But we got to understand the journey. And if I can just explain to you in two minutes here, the journey. Picture two canoes going down the river. I'm not trying to teach us the Wampum Treaty of my cousins in the east. I, 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 I love their, their analogy and their spiritual connection to that. But just picture two canoes going down the river. At the time of Treaty and Treaty 4, because we're in Treaty 4 right now, the signatory chief, where I am from, houses, this is what he envisioned in 1874. He envisioned two canoes going down the river. One canoe is the house's people, the indigenous people, the rights holders. Because indigenous people are not shareholders, not stakeholders. Indigenous people are rights holders in this country. And the other canoe was the crown, was European, was Canadians. And the crown canoe was the Western world view, what we all did today. The other canoe was the indigenous world view. And what was supposed to happen was, is we were supposed to flow down this river as long as the sun shines, grass grows, and river flows. Every generation, we were supposed to exchange a child in each canoe to be raised to know the ideology of that canoe and then be given back. We would always change our mandates and, 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 and philosophy based on the social and economic of us together. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Two years after Treaty 4, the Indian Act was thrown in the Calcis canoe or the Indigenous canoe. And it had one purpose, to imprison the minds of Indigenous people. 22 years later, the residential school was thrown in the Indigenous canoe. It had one purpose, to brainwash the Indigenous people. Today, the canoe kind of fell behind. In 2023, this is what we inherited. This is why universities are so foundational to getting those canoes to line up again. Is you got to know each canoe. There is a hybrid, but you must keep them distinct. And that's not a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with Western world history. We have our issues. I'm not trying to say they're perfect. But we get our mortgages, we get our car loans, we get, we're, we're protected by the Bank Act of Canada. You know, we're a G7 country. You Canadians are coming here because we're a dreamer country because of this strong Western worldview that we've created over the 170 years when you look at this from a world perspective. But internally, domestically, we do have work to do. And every institution across this country, university, must understand that Indigenous people in the Indigenous worldview must be lifted up. We need allies to speak to them. Academics get it. I'm just uh, 13 days ago, I'm a recovering politician. <laughs> <laughs> In the political, economic, and even government, there are ceilings to that indigenous worldview. And this is where we rebuild our minds and reset, and I tell you, it's going to happen. But it's going to not happen sometimes at the pace that we want. But that's the end goal. You know, I've got my six-year-old with me today. Um, what is the end goal? This is the end goal of what we need on the two canoes. Because right now, my little girl wants to be a pilot one day. She told me she wants to drive a plane. So I told her, absolutely, uh, if your mom and I will make you a pilot. So, you know, based on what we all understood and learned yesterday, that indigenous women, the toughest person to be in this country today. Because indigenous world people did not live in high enough yet to understand that relationship and respect. So my wife and I accept that we have to try twice as hard to make my daughter a pilot because of who she is. The end goal is, is that when Callie we would have a daughter one day, she should have tried twice as hard. So we got some work to do. That's why this podcast is important. That's why I'm honored to sit here with these three panelists and our, our moderator. I, said, I come here and I'm like, oh my gosh, you're all my gurus and I get to sit here with you now. It's so honored. Thank you very much for letting this people of the last one.
student. There's one word that I teach my students. She just got a little. You know, that word means to stand together, to stand in support. So that's what we uh, talk about. Sito Scatlin. They know one word what they did in the class. Sito Scatlin. So next I want to um, invite Tammy Rod, who is um, a lecturer with uh, Indigenous languages in our university. And so, um, I welcome Tammy Rad. I never got the five minute memo. <laughs> and I'm not Chanty Hoffman, President Jackie Hoffman. Um, I'm sorry that she couldn't be here to talk to you all today, but I wore my blazer. <laughs> I wish that I wore a color blazer, but she wears color. She's like great. Um, I'm trying to like think of what she might say to you. Just kidding, I couldn't be that. She's amazing. So I'm sorry, I apologize, but um, I do have some good things to say. Um, so that's a Tammy and C. Gaston, and um, Stan and Um, Getting Pickle, Savvy Nick, Ochi Lia, Miguel, Miguel, Mayo, and Los Scottish, this way of looking at them. Yeah, so I just wrote so many notes because it's like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. I'm not an academic. I'm, um, I'm, um, I mean, this is maybe there's just all my things. Okay, this is why I need notes. Um, so thinking about Indigenous led education, I want to start with, uh, word that uh, Joseph Mantel has started us off with um, on Thursday morning. He explained it in and he explained it the sacred reference, uh, sacred space where we're guided. Um, that's the word for university. Um, and he mentioned that Pento was in there. Pento was the word to cry. I never noticed that before, but I did a lot of crying in my undergrad, um, even during my education, which was why I cried, you know, and one of the teachers said you should find a different way to handle stress. <laughs> um, and here I am. Um, and, um, and, um, and then the elder said, no, that's perfect way to handle stress. She's releasing all that um, negative. Anyway, so, um, I like to hear two people. Um, Blair and Angelina were my teachers for my undergrad, and I um, played it three times at school dropout, and the education system wasn't meant for me. Um, and I didn't have an Indigenous teacher until I entered this building, and I came here because I was pregnant, and I didn't want to be a loser to my own child. Um, I went into there. And I think my the first person I met and his name was Joseph. He's my academic advisor. He was my academic advisor through all my university. I never had to make any classes. And all he did was register me for school as a mission student. No questions asked, just register me. After my first year, I decided I want to be a, be a teacher. So um because I had these amazing teachers in that first year of university who thought I was smart and gave me really good marks. And I never felt smart or valued, I still don't feel like I belong here. Um, but I'm here and I'm grateful to be here and it's because of the Indigenous and the Indigenous educators that um, made me feel like I could be here. And the one thing I wanted to say about Indigenous education is um, Hello, oh my God, I got cut. Cut, you talk so long. Um, Indigen ed education is new to Indigenous people. They've been doing it forever, forever before European education systems existed. Um, 
and it was successful, right? This whole like indigenous people have been around forever, like and for so long, and we're still here as um, these education systems were successful for indigenous people and for non-indigenous people. Um, we had engineers, we had farmers, we had hunters, we had doctors even. Um, this was me and yesterday. And they took so much love for this part. Michael Strong, Dr. Michael Strong said, I want to acknowledge the indigenous people that studied medicine before us, you know, like we had doctors. Um, teachers. Um, and the more I learned, the more I realized that indigenous people are like the smartest people ever. Because now I'm learning about theoretic frameworks from Mark Spooner. And um, and there's these theoretic frameworks that I'm like, oh my gosh, this is indigenous research methodologies, you know, and and now they're continuing to they're now they're now the indigenous people are valued. Like these things, these these ideas, these um, like indigenous epistemology, it, it's all been around since before your way, way before your pain project. It's part of our identity. But there's just a couple more things I wanted to uh, mention. I don't know if I actually how long I have, but um, I wrote so many notes, so okay. So, um, one word, a few words I've learned in the past couple of years, actually, over Angelino Lini, and um, one of them is assume, assume obligation, and it's the word is that um, it's our responsibility to pass on knowledge that we learned, and that's a word that I, um, I truly believe it's my responsibility. And I try to learn like every little thing I can just so that I can pass on this knowledge. Um, Ms. Yasselin asked me if he's finding oneself on the land, and um, and I wrote a paper about that. I was going to bring them inside and get them out just because I think that'd be funny. <laughs> I've only broke one paper. Um, um, but really, I got a stack of my face on it. Um, and then another word is Ms. Yasselin making a way in it. He's finding oneself through creeness, being free. Um, and I just think these are, um, these are, hello, <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> um, and they're already wedded in, 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 um, in an indigenous, being indigenous, being Cree, you know, and um, I wanted also, um, I have a quote from Lily Irma that I used in one of my recent papers that I want to get published, so, um, you guys, I'll send you all that, just kidding. <laughs> so, it, Lily Irma Bank says, the West Coast system Yeah, it came through Aboriginal epistemology and it did it through forced into something that promotes the, dog, the dogma of fragmentation and indelibly harm the capacity of holism. He says that it's imperative that our children take up the cause of our languages and cultures because therein lies Aboriginal epistemology, which speaks of holism. Um, and I love, I love this quote. I think um, I had to ask my husband that they call this again, like dogma and fragmentation, indelibly. And I was like, holy cow, who am I? It's a genius. Um, and he knows all these big words. Anyways, um, yeah. So thank you. Um, I love being taught by Indigenous people. They are who make me feel great about myself. I have so much more. I'm going to write a book. <laughs> and it means uh, passing on the knowledge. And I think that's what we're all here for. The Sunamagya. Skate Tamui. That's what it is. Passing on knowledge. Thank you, Tammy. So, Laurie Campbell, I'll read her bio here. Laurie's Two Spirit is a member of Montreal and Cree Nation, Treaty 6 Territory. She is an intergenerational survivor of the Indian residential school system and a child from a 60 school generation. Lori has made in her career advocating for social justice and working towards a more equitable society for all. 
with over 15 years of progressive leadership in student services, academics, research, and administration, Lori is an experienced leader in education. Most recently, she was the oldest female player and the only two-spirit person on CBC's first season of Canada's Love Challenge. Through the sharing of her lived experiences, tra traditional knowledge, and professional proficiencies, she provides uncomfortable truths required for advancing processes of indigenization, decolonization, and reconciliation within organizations and communities. Lori holds two undergraduate degrees, Indigenous Studies and Psychology, a master's degree in adult education, and is a PhD candidate in social justice education. She currently holds the position of Associate Vice President in the Indigenous Education at the University of Regina. Please welcome her. I'll set the timer. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, for starting us off in a good way today, and, and uh, Brother Joseph for, yes, for starting the conference off in a good way, and I want to acknowledge any of the elders, knowledge keepers, and the spirit people that are in the room with us um, today and have participated in the conference. Um, a lot of what I've been thinking about over the last uh, two and a half days as I've been participating in uh, most of the conference as best that I could uh, has just brought about a lot of questions. And I've been observing, um, participating, listening to people um, as everybody's been talking. And uh, I also, I, oh, I also wanted to uh, thank um, uh, Dr. Lee for the Seat the scaffold for you. So I, my career is, is uh, quite poor, but I do work at it. And um, uh, it was the late Isidore Pachy, Isidore Pachy, who had told me once when I was speaking and, and uh, doing my introduction, and I can't say that he was Kasun, and, and uh, um, introducing myself and saying that I felt really awkward doing it. And, and uh, you know, he told me, he said, it's not your shame to bear that you don't know the language. And, and that stuck with me. And so even though my pronunciation um, is not uh, always good, or maybe ever good, um, I just, I put that out there and I think it's important. So for the Indigenous folks um, here, you know, one word at a time, that's what my auntie says. Um, she says one word at a time. And she says often we'll sit down and have discussion and we'll just take one word and we'll all talk about it. And what does that mean? And she let go to me. Um, spoke about that um, this week when she was talking about the root truth and uh, breaking it down, looking at all the ways in which the word in our language is um, all the contributing concepts that go within it. And uh, I think that's a really beautiful thing. If you haven't had opportunity to do that, um, I hope that you do take that opportunity. So, um, throughout the conference, I've been thinking about things like, you know, like, who is uh, this conference for? Not just what are universities for, but who is this conference for? Who are the people that are here? Who is this panel for? And, you know, when I watched um, uh, Sheila speak the other day, and, uh, you know, she's a mentor of mine, um, always picks up the phone when I call, and as do uh, so many folks in the room, too, uh, and very fortunate to have so many mentors. But I was thinking about, as an Indigenous person, when you're presenting to mixed audiences, um, what people are getting out of it and what they're expecting from me. And as an Indigenous learner, when I'm in the audience, sometimes I find it very challenging. I'll go to a conference and I'll be somebody like Sheila or, or Linda Speak or, you know, some amazing Indigenous scholars. And, and as a junior scholar, I want to learn from them. And sometimes I find a conference um, ends up being targeted for the non-Indigenous people. And so as Indigenous leaders, we come in and we speak, and we maybe um, find that we're maybe tailoring a little bit to non-Indigenous peoples. Um, and that seems to somehow sometimes take the focus of things, rather than focusing on the Indigenous people in the room who might want to be uh, learning and asking questions from us. 
and even at the end of um, some of the speakers, I notice who runs to the mics first and who centers themselves on the mics first. And, and uh, a colleague told me, you know, as well that uh, it's, uh, you know, um, shown as respectful to make sure that you're asking questions, you know, after a speaker speaks. But, uh, in, you know, for Indigenous people, racialized people, queer people, as minorities within the room, um, you know, it might take a moment for us to get our thoughts together before we, will, before we come up to speak or want to ask a question. Or if we see a lineup of white people at the mic already, we might not get up and ask a question. And it's intimidating um, to get up and ask a question. And uh, I, I uh, honor the Indigenous, young Indigenous the folks who have got up and asked questions in sort of the sea of whiteness and, and how challenging um, that can be. And so I thought about that throughout the conference, like who, who, is, who is the conference for? And um, who, who gets centered in some, of, in some of the conversations? I also have thought about the conference and uh, you know the act of decolonizing and and, uh, and, and my work in general. I mean, you know, this is uh, uh, this has been a great conference, by the way. I've loved it. I've loved working, you know, a little bit that I've been alongside Mark to help um, uh, you know participate in any way that I, that I can in the conference. But I think these are good questions to ask. You know, like um, are we are we um, doing what we're talking about, or are we just theorizing about it? Are we theorizing about decolonizing? Are we, um, you know, theorizing about how, you know, indigenous indigeneity should be expressed and supported within institutions, or are we actually doing it? And in a more simpler way, sometimes I think about how, um, at our vigils, we have a, a lot of vigils, and um, it's important to us that others show up who are not from our communities and who are indigenous. But what I've often said now is what's more important is what are you doing between the vigils? And I feel like sometimes the same thing between conferences is what, what are um, uh, allies, uh, people who are hoping to be allies, doing between the conferences to actually take action. Because writing a paper isn't necessarily the action that we need, right? Um, a, a lot of what we need is to hand over the resources and step back. We know, we know what we can do, we know that we can organize, um, and so sometimes it's not about sort of creating a research project for us, but you know, saying, you know what, there's this great research grant, and uh, I would like to, if there's something you would like to do, I would like to mentor you so that you can actually put a team together and apply for it, and I will just be, you know, the collaborator. Um, and support you in that way. Uh, I think those are some ways in particular um, that we can center indigeneity within our institutions. I also like, and this is, this is uh, both for indigenous and non-indigenous peoples in the room, but for racialized people, I think we seriously need to think whether you're a student going to be an employee, whether it's in academia or somewhere else, if somebody is seeing you out here applying for a job, I think you need to be asking, what have you done to prepare for me to be here? Why are we seeking me out? And if they can only say because you're indigenous, then that is not the place for you. Because we are more than our indigeneity as well. Like we're, we're, we're in these institutions, we're educated, we have skills, we, have, we bring our indigeneity with us, um, and it tells you know, the lens through which we experience the world but we also have those same papers, those same degrees, the same um, learning that may not also be the papers, but may be within community or within language-based or mind-based learning. And um, those are valued by some. And, uh, and I think we need to be asking that question. I did ask that question when I had to go on the roll back here at the University of Virginia. What has the executive table done to prepare to have an indigenous queer um, person at this executive table, and uh, and I did, you know, work to make an informed decision. I know that the University of Regina, uh, I think, probably one of the leaders in having indigenous, a number of indigenous peoples we have on our board of directors, and and I had this uh, being one of them, and, and uh, two others at the time, and that makes the kind of work that I need to do more easy because I'm not fighting my board 
or my leadership team because we have indigenous leaders or expertise, lawyers, you know, politicians, and politicians, you know, they're at that table, and so I've done all the work, all the burden is not on me. And for um, students, if you have a scholar, a professor that is um, saying, you know, that they're recruiting indigenous students or they want you to come, uh, you need to ask them, interview them, it's just as much um, their privilege to work with you as it is for them, or for, uh, for you to work with, uh, for them to work with you as it is for what they want from you. And so are we prepared, uh, if they're not indigenous, to, um, to support your unapologetic indigenous thought and theorizing and dreamers theory and stories theory and languages theory and ceremonies theory to do the work that you need to do? Have they set aside and considered within your budget that you may need, you know, uh, an extra piece of the budget so that you can go over to the sweat lodge and uh, appropriately compensate, um, you know, your own children and elders in order to uh, dream your theory that is going to inform your research. But I think those are important questions. And then for our colleagues who are not Indigenous, who um, are, you know, ready to uplift us in those spaces, uh, you know, there is work to be done. We're not there to teach you. We're not there to break down the door when we come into those positions. I recognize my role as the AP is to do some education. I've taken that on, but certainly not students um, or hiring them. It's just faculty members not there to teach and uh, advance the careers of their non-Indigenous colleagues within the institution. Uh, I'm just going to pick my nose. I think that's what I want to do now, so thank you. And so I think to kind of recap, you know, we all had a journey, which my Cami was talking about. A journey where we were seeking a place of higher learning and, um, you know, we wanted that knowledge and it was in a university and, and so now we learn the Western ways of knowing and slowly we started to understand that we also had knowledge and that's why, you know, we, we teach and one of the you know, it's the elders who have shown us the way. And it was, um, I wrote, um, I read uh, a paper by Lightning in 1992. And he talked about in the indigenous mind. That's what we are talking about, the indigenous thinkers. You know, and the indigenous mind brings in all aspects of our lives, our cultures, traditions, languages. That is what indigenous mind means. So that is what we um, speak about when we teach. And so, you know, we have relied on Western knowledges, Western books. Now we are writing our own books, just like Dr. Stonechild. And there is a book that uh, is in the works and it's called Dance Your Style, Pre-Pedagogy. So it's going to relate, you know, focus on pre-pedagogy. We're not going to rely on anything else but our own knowledge. There is, you know, lots of knowledge that we can draw on. And so that is the place where uh, in terms of, um, you know, what are universities for? We have learned from you. <laughs> and we're going to be following that path you know, to um, reclaim and uh, revitalize, awaken our knowledges and languages. Kiranas Mungnan, Dr. Yo, and 
Are there any um, comments or questions from anybody who would like to ask? Her? I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Linda Smith, who's with us. Hi. <laughs> Yeah, you joined us yesterday and we are on board with Ms. Stella for a spare chance to visit with her. But also, we have a beer line here. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, good people to have to join us today. Are there any other uh, comments from the panel or from the audience? Sorry, one more comment that came to mind is when we're looking at people's CVs uh, for advancement for employment, uh, I think it is important. It is important that non-Indigenous peoples um, engage with us, go to workshops, learn. But those pieces should not be used as merit to advance their careers. Because if I put on my resume the amount of times I've educated white people, I think like. Like it would just exponentially build, but we do that and we see that. Sometimes we view that and we hire and they'll hire committees and you'll view somebody who's a non-Indigenous person as a resume is like, wow, look at all the work they put into learning about Indigenous peoples. You know, look at every Indigenous person in the room and think about all the work that we've done to fight to be here and to thrive. for this uh, opportunity, my, my panel uh, co-hosts here. Um, I just wanted to mention one last thing in my closing. You know, I talked about the two canoes. I just want to really emphasize, anybody is welcome to be Indigenous canoe. It doesn't matter if you're vanilla colored, caramel colored, it doesn't matter. But when you're in that canoe, just understand that an Indigenous worldview is foundational. Go in, don't go into that kind of assumptions because of what you thought of the Western world would be. Truth is just now being told today. The baby boomer generation, next generation, why, and new Canadians that have just arrived, they're not really taught the truth. And it's indigenous and not. I went to a reserve school and I, I learned my truth here at First Nations University of Canada. But when you're in that indigenous world, you can do which I really hope each of you step in. Because it does mean allies, and it does mean um, building blocks with it, is to go in there open-minded. Go in there knowing that basic things like humor mean different. When you're in that indigenous world you can do and somebody teases you, that means we like you. <laughs> Just remember that, like, like humor is foundational. It's a law given to us from the Creator that has been kept keeping the glue of our family and tribes together since time immemorial. But also, when we're in that Western worldview, it's just remember that that the Indigenous worldview is is respected, and we need allies to speak up because Indigenous people are thriving. You know, I say this in the most nicest way I can. I've been chief for seven years, and we've achieved humanity poverty. Is indigenous people sometimes we've kind of become our own worst enemies to each other today because of how much pain and frustration we've been in and how much survival points we're still in today. And for my beautiful vanilla colored Western, uh, you know, the ones, that's not your fight. But that's for you to understand as allies, that as indigenous people, we don't want pity, we don't want anybody to feel sorry for us. 
We just want to make sure our indigenous worldview is lifted as high as it can go. And you know, that's the importance of when I was invited to this talk. And Mark met at me and I said, oh no, it's coordination day, I told him. <laughs> I actually toured King Charles of this university. It was my absolute last comment. <laughs> the Secret Service. When the FN, I was a student at the time, then uh, FNUC said, Captain, can you tour Prince Charles and Camilla? I was like, sure. <laughs> so I started meeting with Secret Service, and like, you can't touch him, you can't tell him what to do, and you can only tell him that you're wrong. I'm like, this guy's human, right? <laughs> so I read his book, and I knew he liked gardens, I knew he liked architects, so I was all ready. But I'm like, I'm going to make this guy. Like, he, he must be such a. Like just a, like, like a life of, like I gotta show him the indigenous world here, so I thought I was joking, I was joking. <laughs> so I'm touring him here, thousands of people, but it was just him and Kamala and I, like really close. And I said, your royal highness, on behalf of all my people, I just want to tell you, we'd like to get you down with the place. <laughs> <laughs> and we, uh, he looked at me, he looked away, he looked at me again, and he smiled. <laughs> I got a dad in Jubilee a couple of years later, so I must have made him laugh. <laughs> Thank you very much for the honor. Thank you. Uh, Dennis likes, knows how our people like to joke around and have fun. And what I told him, I said, you know, Back in the old traditional days when we didn't have to worry about working from nine to five and making money, we had lots of time to sit around and tell jokes. And then so I get in my classroom and tell them the realities and then all of a sudden it gets very serious. <laughs> because, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I say is, you know, we, we as Indigenous people have not only been physically colonized, we've also been mentally colonized. And I also rush to say that, you know, when you look at the folks like your own back, backgrounds, you know, all of you have at one point come from an indigenous background. And all of you have actually been mentally colonized as well. And uh, I know one of the first insights that I got when uh, Elliot Fuss has told me about the story of the Garden View, I realized, you know, what they told me in residential school was a lie. Adam and he were not the first people. <laughs> There was a whole lot of bunch of indigenous people I worked before. And so that's the kind of thing that, uh, that uh, you know, they made me realize this whole thing about the original sin and stuff like that. That's not, that's not something that we ever, ever heard about. But, uh, you know, Canada's thing, politicians used to talk a lot, but uh, they used to respect the parents who are the worst. And I realized that I had finished talking about this chapter that I talked about, about how I'll criticize criticizing the university this guy. So anyway, I'll make it really short. Uh, my primary criticism of, uh, of the um, uh, way in which things are approached at the university is basically the, comes down to the uh, question of the age of reason and rationalism. And uh, the um, saying that I came up with uh, uh, after having done research on this book is that uh, knowledge in the hands of unspiritual people is a very dangerous thing. Now, you know, people thought that the indigenous people were not rational, but there's some else who think you know We had very good minds, and we could figure out very good things. But the thing is, we did not act on any of those until we thought the public was spiritually appropriate. You know, to us, spirituality is the highest form of intelligence. You know, like it's uh, something that I might call wisdom. You know, I sometimes talk about it today when people ask me, about you know, how can you have indigenous chemistry? And I simply say, well, if we had indigenous chemistry, you know, we, we wouldn't be creating all of those chemicals that kill people, that kill animals, that kill plants. Right? We're going to simply earn free money. That's the difference between indigenous knowledge and non-indigenous knowledge. And we have all of the stuff that's coming out on the list is now with artificial intelligence. We've got the Lord and Most High coming out. You see, this is the stuff that's produced when all you use is, is your reasonable faculties and you don't use your spiritual intelligence. 
That's the difference. And so that's one of the messages that I think that we're trying to get out as a university. This is this is how we're different, right? And um, that's the message that we have to offer. Spirituality is a very important thing, and that's what's sort of lacking to be at least in the modern university education. So if you that, thank you. I wasn't writing the my notes. I just wanted to say a lot of cadence. <laughs> Same age. But um, I'm talking when he was taking three when I a wedding. He was so much more mature and like responsible. <laughs> but I always told him that I would tell him that I was going to talk. Because like I wanted to take credit for how he turned out. <laughs> Also, I just wanted to I just wanted to quickly say, um, sticking with Indigenous-led education and what universities are for. Um, and I've heard a lot about public good, but I've made a list of the things that I I want, you know, in this university as I'm getting my PhD. I I want my that my um, my knowledge value. I want to be provided with the experiences that ins inspire me provide me opportunities where I can meet people who inspire me, and I want to believe anything is possible. Yeah. And I feel that um, the universe, the First Nations University of Regina has like made me believe Indigenous research, you know, Linda, Linda Smith, um, Kathy Absalom, um, um, Audrey G, where I just got to spend a semester with her, um, make me believe anything is possible, so much so that I've applied for a PhD. And and that's not me, you know, that's, um, it's like all these, these amazing Indigenous people that are, uh, I'm surrounded by and, uh, and that's why Indigenous-led education is so important, is, um, um, like, I spent my whole semester in, like, the art room, like, naturally dying things, you know? And um, I have little friends that are, like, scraping high right now, like, they hunted, scraped, and, like, um, I truly believe anything is possible. And as a teacher of um, young people, my goal to pass on to any educator is just students, young people, believe that anything is possible. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> 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 <laughs>